everybody, and thank you for coming out today for our final in-person, most sandwiched in program of the season. We do have one coming up in July that will just be a video review, but we are grateful for everyone coming today to hear our program. Um, just to start with a few announcements. For everyone's safety, if there is a need to evacuate the building, the door on your left to my right is the closest exit. Uh, and for anyone using a hearing aid, we invite you to take advantage of our induction loop system. It amplifies all sound coming through the microphone. And along those lines, if we have time for Q&A at the end, please wait for this mic to reach you so that everyone can hear and participate. Please silence or turn off your cell phones now so as not to disrupt the speaker. And we want to thank the Friends of Brighton Memorial Library for sponsoring this program. Um, I do want to point out that we have our next Friends of the Library book sale coming up in this room starting on Thursday, June 9th. That's correct, and running through the following Monday. So please come back for that. And for anyone else who enjoys um, our book-related programs, we do have some other things coming up, like a book discussion group on Zoom on June 21st. And then also that evening in person, we have Deaths in the National Parks, a talk by local author Randy Minotaur, and we will be giving away some copies of her books as well on the related topic. So please grab a brochure. They are by the um, table by the door. And now to introduce or to welcome our speaker, we are very happy today to have Barbara Applebaum, who is a former director of the Center for Holocaust Awareness and Information, and she still volunteers with the organization. Um, I'll let her talk a bit more about some of the resources we have, but you can check the table over there by the window for some of the um, books that we'll be talking about, as well as pick up a brochure um, that our library put together with Barbara's help um, called Beyond Anne Frank, and one of our uh, part-time li uh, reference librarians, Allison Helms, who is here, she was instrumental in getting this resource together. So thank you, Allison, for all your work on this. And we also have this book of Barbara's that we'll be adding to our collection that she was an editor on, uh, The Perilous Journeys. So I'll put it over there for people to look through. It can't be checked out yet until we get in the system, but please do take a look. And with that, we'll pass the mic to Barbara. Thank you. And I guess I have the mic on me, so I don't have to hold that, so thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Hinda, and the rest of you for inviting me to review Judy Battalion's book. Uh, the Untold Story of Women Resistance Fighters in Hitler's Ghettos. Okay, the subtitle and the title of the book are um, very interesting because I was going to refer to other books uh, with a similar kind of title uh, that have been produced uh, since the 2015. Uh, right now we have The Code Girls, the untold story of the American women code breakers of World War II came out in 2018. And in 2016, there was a book and later movie that many of you probably saw and was really so revealing. Uh, it's called Hidden Figures, The American Dream, and the untold story of black women mathematicians who helped win the space race. How many of you have seen that one? No, I mean, it was really a revelation. And so I was really, all of a sudden, you know, I'm looking at this title, and she does the same thing. The Light of Days, the Untold Story of Women Resistance Fighters in Hitler's Ghettos. So there is <clears throat> women and, and what they've done in untold stories is the theme since 2015. And, um, this book is uh, a game changer. It really is. Uh, because it brings the, uh, it's a new chapter on Jewish resistance, which we've avoided speaking about for a very long time because it's a very difficult topic to uh, discuss. You know, what is resistance, what is resilience, and so forth. I'm so happy to be back in the Brighton Library uh, and to reconnect with the amazing staff. Uh, Allison and Dina and, um, and their resources here. And hot off the presses, it's the first time that anyone's seen it, uh, was something that they produced called Beyond and Frank. And it is a resource for doing further resource, resource, research on uh, the whole area of trauma, resistance, and resilience during war. And I think they've done an amazing job. They pack so much information into one brochure. It's just quite an achievement. And I'll be referring a little bit to that, so I hope you have a copy of that. 
Uh, <clears throat> my handout is a uh, more extensive list of um, local resources and um, the uh, websites that you can go to if you want to do some further research. And I have given you a sheet on Survivor. I'm going to be talking about the um, resource that I'm still working at as a volunteer. Uh, it's an uh, archive of Survivor testimonies from Rochester and their um, uh, stories. I'd like to introduce Cami Mass, whose story is in that archive. She's a survivor and uh, an important witness, and we're so happy that you came to hear me talk about it. Um, and I don't know if there are any children of survivors here. No. Okay. When we're talking about Debbie Rothman. <laughs> yes. Children. Children. Second generation. We're going to be talking about them too. Um, I want to uh, give a brief overview of the book and its importance. How many of you read the book? Fabulous. Okay. Uh, I'm going to focus Ed, on the need of Judy as a grandchild of survivors to write this book and to come to terms with their own family history. I think that's an underlying story that's uh, in the book and uh, that I traced. Uh, and along the way, as uh, Dina said, I'm going to refer to some related stories from Rochester Holocaust Center Survivor Archive that will never be finished. <laughs> the stories go on and on and on. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about how hearing some survivor testimony uh, the effect it's had on the students that I had observed. Okay, so that's a lot to talk about, and I don't know how much how, how much we're going to get through this. But let me just say that since this publication last year, the Light of Days caused quite a sensation. Uh, Judy is a sought-after speaker, and her recorded interviews are all over the internet. And uh, you know, if you're in further interested in her, uh, you know, I suggest that you go on YouTube and I just put in her name. Um, and it, it, the book vividly depicts the exploits of a group of 17 young Jewish women who worked in the underground resisting the Nazis in various Pol Pol uh, Polish locales in ghettos and forced, and forced labor and concentration camps. And the stories are astonishing. I mean, they are really grab you. Um, what she does is set these stories, each one of them, 23 chapters of stories. It's, it's a very dense book. Uh, she weaves the stories together, but also talks about the context in which these women uh, did what they did. Uh, she gives a detailed description of the towns, villages, and cities where the action takes place. And her time frame is 1939 to 1943, if you really want to understand what she gives you the list of characters but what she doesn't do is say in each chapter these characters are going to speak about this place and this is their exploit so uh, I thought of making it short but I didn't in the end um, depending upon you now the time frame is 1939 to 1945 which takes us through uh, the beginning of the war and uh, ends up basically with the Warsaw Ghetto uprising in 1943 and depending on the year of their activities, uh, depending on the year, their activities range from sneaking in and out of those ghettos, disguised as Polish Catholic women, um, bringing in food and vital information, uh, distributing fake passports and ID cards, and later engaging with men in armed rebellion, smuggling in guns and ammunition and fancy pocketbooks and sacks of potatoes, actually taking part in the shooting with bombs and guns. Judy, in one of her stories, relates how a Nazi officer seeing women firing rifles down at them in the Warsaw Ghetto looks up and is in disbelief. A woman fighting? A woman fighting? The picture that he's seeing in his eyes while he's in the middle of fighting is inconceivable to most people as well as him, living in the 1940s, women fighting, but especially to German soldiers who have been indoctrinated with the sexist ideas about women's place in Nazi Germany. 
women, the women she writes about, have taken advantage of the, uh, that view of women and use their feminist wiles to smuggle in the weapons into the Warsaw ghetto. They flirt, uh, they use, they're attractive women, they're, they're quite attractive women. And uh, in one case, uh, they get uh, the guard that's guarding the Warsaw ghetto to bring in the rifles <laughs> that are at the bottom of the sack, uh, on, on, on top is, is a sack of potatoes. <laughs> and she's carrying this heavy bag, and he brings it in for her. Little does he know what it contains. So these are amazing pictures uh, of women and, uh, and resistance. And um, for a long time, those stories were out. One of the things that the book tells us is that the story of women resisting was out as early as night in the 1940s, 5, 46. And Romkowski, who was the leader of the, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto, would speak about these heroic deeds. And the women actually, post-war, after the war, would go, who, most of whom went to Israel, or what was Palestine then, and they would go around speaking about the underground movement, the resistance that they did and other women. And the problem was they weren't really believed. <laughs> that is the problem with a lot of the stories of the Holocaust, that they're sort of repressed because that image of women, we were prepared to, to see at that point. Uh, now, Judy has her own story, and that is that she's a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And she was raised in Montreal, Canada, and part of a Jewish community uh, and her grandmother was the one who basically raised her because her mother had lots of problems. And so every day after school, her grandmother would pick her up and would tell her the story of her daring escape from the Warsaw Ghetto. And she, I mean, her, her story really could have been part of, you know, resistance and fighter, but she didn't, she didn't stay in Warsaw, but went to uh, across the Russian border into Siberia. She went further east. As many people, as I find out from the book, 200,000 out of 300,000 survivors went, and that's how they survived. Ironically, in running, running east into um, the, well, and winding up in Siberia, but some of them wound up in Kazakhstan, some of the Kipsans, they were the one who survived. Uh, I still think that's a large figure. I, I, I don't know, I, I didn't do the research to, to figure that one out. But um, the problem was that her grandmother never got over the trauma of losing her whole family and being left alone. She became paranoid and a hoarder. She gave birth to her daughter, her mother, Judy's mother, in 1945, while she was going back to Poland after the war. And she was born in a hospital <laughs> in which uh, it was bar barely functioning. Uh, uh, and uh, so that was her mother's story. Uh, it's hard to say whether her mother was uh, a second generation, what they call a second generation child of survivors, or a third generation, which she basically would be categorized as a third generation survivor, because of how early she escaped and how early she was born. And she acted, she had the trauma she, of, of that experience of being raised by her mother and she also became a hoarder. And so Judy was raised in a family, and the, the name of the book that she wrote in her memoir, she wrote a memoir afterward, describing the, um, how it was for her to be raised in uh, this family in Montreal by her grandmother, and what it was like for her 
to live in a house where they ate on the floor and if she had a nightmare, she couldn't, there was no space in her mother's bed to be snuggled by her mother if she had a, a, a nightmare. But there was, as she describes, a lot of love in the family, you know, that her parents loved her. And she um, was dealing with her trauma in, by 2007 uh, when she, but she runs away to London. She's at this time been educated at Harvard. She has a Harvard degree, and she has a PhD uh, in history uh, from, um, I forget where, but she, she, she's very well educated, but she's run far away from her family home in Montreal, and she is by day working as a, um, A, a, um, a historian, uh, it's actually, it was unclear, of um, American, uh, not American, she, of, of, she was working as a historian, uh, let me see, yeah. um, and at night, she was a comedian. <laughs> and there was something that didn't figure about that. I'm saying, where, where did she get that, you know, how did that work? She's, Mrs. Maisel, I don't know how many of you have <laughs> seen that podcast with Mrs. Maisel, but she was working as a comedian. She uh, was wanting to, she was having problems being in London, being separated. She was 30 years old and she was single. And this is the other story, we're on to Judy's story. She, she claims that, and, and she speaks a lot about it in the, um, in, in the interviews that she gives, that she and, and she wanted this performance piece uh, about strong Jewish women. Why did she want to have that? Well, she was feeling anxious and she was feeling danger, and she was looking to write a, a performance piece about uh, strong Jewish women. The only woman she knew about was Hannah Senesch. How many of you have heard of Hannah Senesch? <laughs> it's the one. She's the poster child of resistance. She was born in Hungary, and she went back. She went. She uh, went to Palestine. It was then Palestine, uh, and to fight with the Allied troops in uh, in Hungary. Going back to Hungary to fight. She learned how to be a paratrooper, and so she was. She went down into enemy lines, and she unfortunately was caught very, very early on, and I found it very tragic. And she is brutally tortured. Uh, they want to know who she's working for, who are the people who, uh, you know, she can tell, who, who, who helped her? <laughs> who does she work with? And uh, she refuses. Um, her mother at this time uh, comes to Palestine, and she's there too. We, we found this information uh, in, in a video about her. Uh, but she refuses to give up her information and she is executed and she's known for refusing to wear anything over her head but she looks her executioner bravely and with defiance into their own. So that's the story that Judy knows from fifth grade. I think some of us learned it in Hebrew school too. She, she, as I said, she's a poster child of resistance. So what Judy is looking for is what give what gave Hannah Senate the 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 idea the the courage the bravery to go back to the war <coughs> and to do what she did. How is it humanly possible for her to have? Uh, where did her bravery come from? How is it humanly possible for, for her to do what she did? So, uh, she goes to the British Library, and so she asks for books on Hanasevich, and that's when she came across a book on all the, um, so many other Jewish resistors, 17 of them, dozens of stories, and she was amazed. Uh, she was inspired then 
to research further to see what was the uh, underlying story of these women, all these women. How did they do it? How, who organized them? What gave them the strength to do what they did? All these questions that she had about the sentence now, she is um, uh, going to ask of the women that she will research. And this is 2007. By 2007, as I told you, the stories were out, but suppressed. And so she, she finds this out. The name of the book that she came across was Freud in the Ghetto, W-I, I pronounced that right. And the, it was written in Yiddish. Now, it turns out that Judy, I think, probably heard her grandmother's stories in Yiddish. And she heard them day after day. And they had become part of her psyche. And so did the pain and the rage that her grandmother expressed. So the trauma, and she's reading about trauma. At, at this point, the uh, studies have come out that traumatic, expect, uh, traumatic experiences are almost genetically passed on to the children and grandchildren. And she's wondering whether this is what's happening with her. Why is she feeling this anxiety, this, this, this danger? And, um, and so she, uh, that's why what got her interested in, in exploring further the tales of uh, these 17 women. Uh, and, and, and the book that she wrote finally, but it, it took her 12 years. <laughs> she was a single woman in London, and she, um, in the 12 years that she was writing her book, she got married, believe it or not, to another hoarder, a man who also was raised in a family of hoarding, and, not too, I couldn't find too much about him, but I find that fascinating. She moved to New York City with him and raised three daughters, okay? So by the time she wrote the book, she had these life experiences that really changed her. And um, she was still, as I said, on and off writing the book. What happened was that she tells, and again, this is her story. She's choosing to tell it that way. It's very dramatic. Um, I'm going to also, uh, right now, talk about her brother. Her brother, Eli, at this point, he's about three years younger, has experienced the same uh, trauma, shall we say, and he still is in Montreal. He wrote the book, Judaism. Have any of you seen that movie? It was at the film festival. Henry, I think you did. It was a tour of Jewish Montreal's delicatessens. Do you remember that? And he and his partner, took us on a tour, if you saw the movie, and it's it, Judaism is spelled C-H-E-W, Judaism, Judaism, okay? If you look at Eli, and he also is now working on um, a podcast of a called, oh, my words, all right, uh, the name of the podcast is, uh, okay, he, can, he, call, he claims himself, he's a writer, producer, director, actor, and composer of film. I mean, think about it. He's brought up in, in, in the household he was, and he's on the web, and TV, and stage, okay? So, so he, um, he uh, what is it called? Yeah. All right. Yid life crisis. Yid life crisis. 
Uh, and any, have any of you seen, seen them? As I'm going through all this, I, I, I know that her brother is, is um, Eli, because she um, is interviewed by Spielberg's um, sister, and the, the one interview that I saw. And um, Spielberg's sister wrote, uh, who will write our history about the Warsaw Ghetto? I, I'm sorry, not, didn't write it, Sam Gassad uh, wrote it, but produced um, the, um, the movie. Spielberg's sister is also a television producer, and she produced the movie Who Will Write Our History? And if you see that movie, it's, it's quite something that's about uh, the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, he was uh, a friend. Eli, her brother, is a friend of Steven Spielberg. Now, Steven Spielberg has commissioned this book already to be a movie. I can see it more as a television series. I think it would be much better, you know, if each chapter of these, of, you know, that tells a different exploit of these women in the, uh, in, in the underground, rather than put it all together in the movie. I think that's going to be a very, very challenging thing to do. But, Let's stay tuned and see if the movie gets written <laughs> and what it looks like. Uh, if you remember, uh, Steven Spielberg uh, did Schindler's List, and he was able to, um, uh, at the Oscars, he won an Oscar for the film, at the Oscars, he comes out with this, a lot of chutzpah, <laughs> he says, I am going to, uh, Make a, um, I'm going to, to record the testimony of any survivor in the world who would be interested in giving their testimony. And he just makes this statement. He has no organization, nothing. Well, at this point, uh, there are about 150 Holocaust educational um, institutions, and uh, like the center that uh, Dina said, the Center for Holocaust Awareness and Information, and uh, they put aside their own projects, because most, most of them were taping the survivors, uh, who were willing to talk by this time. And uh, so I also uh, became part of that movement. Uh, the Shoah Foundation is what he established. He, he, he made good on his promise. And the Shoah Foundation uh, would send out to a place like Rochester, they would they would um, uh, send out a professional videographer to take, you know, a local professional videographer, and this was just wonderful because uh, when we were taping, and Debbie started, Debbie started the Holocaust Center and uh, had started a videotape. I guess you used the studio of uh, one of the television, local television stations that had said they wanted to take the survivor stories. Well, we, uh, and we were trained in, in their way of telling, uh, uh, in interviewing survivors so that there would be consistency. It was half an hour before the survivor, you know, where the survivor grew up and his family, the, the place he came from, where life was from. And so that becomes a source of people doing research, if you want to know what Poland was like, for example, uh, and then about an hour of the story of the survivor, the ghettos he or she was in, or was he in hiding, and so forth, up until liberation, and then a half an hour of their life after the war, which is very important because we want to know what it was like for them to return to life to begin anew and to um, come to the communities in which they came to if they left Poland or if they remained in Poland, uh, about what life was like then. So we have this broad possibility of seeing the total life of the survivor. Um, and we were doing that basically, but we were using, we started with the technology kept on following us so that what we did originally was take these survivors on, uh, on audio, 
Okay, remember those? People don't even know what a, what a audio a, a player looks like anymore, a tape recorder. It, we, we don't even have tape recorders. But at that point, we were using tapes, okay, audio tapes. And then we went, and you, we could try some video tapes, VHS tapes, okay, and then we went to high eight, and then we went to uh, uh, taping that would make them available on the internet. And so, um, Steven Spielberg succeeded in getting 55,000 testimonies for his organization. 55,000 survivors. And of course, it's Spielberg who wants you to talk. So a lot of the survivors who were uh, reluctant to speak <laughs> said, oh, Steven Spielberg wants me to do it, I'll do it. Or maybe their children would say, Mom, Dad, you've got to tell your story. And yeah, here's a wonderful opportunity. So, and so, um, what he did afterward, which I think is an amazing achievement, is that he had researchers so that for each second of the testimony, uh, and this took an enormous amount of time, for each se second of, of, or, or minute, I should say, he would document with keywords, so people could search for this testimony if they want, you know, somebody from Finland, <laughs> somebody who wound up in Finland, you know, you, you would have all these, these uh, places. The most important research was, of course, about the Polish towns and villages and cities that they were, that, that the people came from. Now, uh, when we first started taping uh, with survivors, we relied on volunteers, uh, who we trained, and uh, myself. Uh, however, we found that most people had a fiddler on the roof shuttle like, Te uh, like Tevye we lived in, in Fiddler on the Roof, uh, as their image of what Poland was like. Okay? What we didn't realize is what Judy Battalion gives us, for example, in her uh, book, because she, she has an accurate setting of what it was like to grow up in Poland in the 30s. There were vibrant communities, very advanced, very sophisticated, very, very modern in the cities. And there were, it, they flourished, and Jewish life flourished in these towns and cities. And this is another important way that we have to make the girls in the underground that she is describing come alive. Where did they come from? How did they live? What were their families like? And um, what was it like when the girls found that their families were killed? Most of them were killed, and they knew about it because they were running in and out of ghettos, and they were disguised as Polish Catholics, as I told you, so that they had to, uh, if, if they found out about their parents, they, uh, that, that made them full of rage, and that which was fueling their, um, their deeds, their, 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 um, what they did. Um, the other thing that Judy found was that the, these girls who were in the underground were basically trained before the war there were a hundred thousand youth who joined these youth movements. They couldn't join the scouts, but they could, they had their own youth movements, their own militias. If you go to the Holocaust Museum, uh, probably how many of you have gone there, to the Holocaust Museum, uh, the museum shows uh, the extent of these youth movements. And they taught self-reliance. They were egalitarian, so that they were the ones the ones that Judy writes about. The girls in the underground were in the more um, um, secular and socialist kind of youth movements. A lot of them were Zionistic. They were being prepared to go to Israel, 
As a matter of fact, there were, um, there were trained agricultural communities they were teaching these girls who wanted to go, and boys obviously, uh, who wanted to go to Israel to learn how to farm because Israel had uh, mostly Hebrew theme or these agricultural communities, and they would um, be prepared. But there were a lot of, of these girls who were really very nationalistic. Just, you know, they, they were Poles and they wanted to um, remain in Poland and to, uh, to uh, be able to um, give back to their own community. But be that as it may, they, uh, the, these, these youth groups used to have weekends where they were taught pride in their identity, in their Jewish identity. They were taught self-reliance. They were taught and, and how to work together. <laughs> and Judy describes that research that she did on the youth movements in the 30s in Poland as being the next book she's interested in writing about because it's so fascinating uh, to, to see that. Uh, the women that were raised were very modern in a way, and, and that's how she portrays them, uh, who, who could defend themselves and who could, um, uh, were interested in, in, in cooperative living and, and the ideals of, of the socialist ideals of working together and, and creating a better community. But unfortunately and ironically, it was those very lessons that the girls learned uh, from the youth movement that they were able to then uh, use in their underground activities. Um, so, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we what we did and what we learned uh, at the Holocaust Center from um, interviewing these survivors. And I always had at my ear a Greek chorus of one lady. Her name was Anasus Paul. And she would explain to me what was going on. She t shared what it was like to come to the United States having lost her family and having to rebuild her life. She complained to me bitterly. She worked at Mollock's, by the way. Any of you have been in uh, Mollock's Bakery would have seen her. She complained to me. She said, you know, people, she came from Lodz, Poland, the second largest city in Poland. <laughs> and people would come up to her, you know, if they knew she was a Holocaust survivor. And one of the things that I find interesting, she, she had a number in her arm, I remember that, but I don't remember her with the, 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 the mark on her arm. You know, it wasn't very evident. And she told me her number. She and her sister survived together. Uh, and she said, people are asking me, do you know what a movie is? Do I know what a movie is? <laughs> I went to tons of movies. I used to go every Saturday. And she told me the story about how her, her mother was more religious than her father. And her father would sneak in the, 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 the money to go to the movie, and she'd go and sneak out and go to the movies. But she said, people are telling me that I should forget about what happened to me in Poland. She said, forget about it? How can I forget about it? You know, if they had experienced their brother and their mother and their father being killed, would they think, forget about it? I can't forget about it. And so, you know, it, it was this kind of feeling that I cannot tell my story. Uh, people are, they're not interested. So the survivor community, the ones who were camp, concentration camp survivors, um, stuck together, told their own stories, and were family to each other. They were substitute families. They used to go to Charlotte. When they were from Rochester, you know, they'd go to picnics on Charlotte, and they would talk about what happened to them. They would share their stories. Um, <laughs> so, this is the group, and we, we're going to refer now to the nice pamphlet because uh, Allison took a picture of the, um, 
And if you need one of these, she, I'm going to be a teacher now. Definitely. Yeah, Beyond and Frank. Okay, here. Let's let's look at it because now I have the visual. If I really was into the 20, 2022, I would have had a PowerPoint presentation and shown some some images. But thanks to Allison, we have this brochure. Anybody else? Oh, sorry. If you open the brochure. You will see a picture of the Holocaust Memorial Garden in Portland, okay? And it was the first thing that 